Many of you know Dr. Tom Phelps. He's a well-respected area pediatrician, and he's a former member of the West Geauga Board of Education. Recently, we asked Dr. Phelps if he would be willing to respond to some questions that the district collected related to COVID-19. This video is an encapsulation of his answer to those questions. Good morning, this is uh, Dr. Tom Phelps. I'm a 30-year resident in Geauga County. Um, I've had my kids go through the school, and I'm a pediatrician also for uh, 30 years in Chesterland and the Geauga County area. Um, I'm here today to uh, talk about some recommendations and guidance from the um, pediatric world, especially from the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, as far as helping people to understand um, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and how it interacts with students, schools, and families. Um, I'd like to start with an opening statement from the American Academy of Pediatrics. This was dated June 26, uh, 2020. Um, the evidence from spring of 2020 school closures points to the negative impact on learning. Um, so the American Academy of Pediatrics is um, advocating children going back to school. Um, children and adolescents also have been at a higher risk of morbidity and mortality from things like abuse, substance use, anxiety, depression, uh, and unfortunately suicidal ideation too. The American Academy strongly advocates that all policy considerations for the coming school year would start with a goal of having students physically present in school. And one of the key statements I want to uh, help everyone to understand is the intervention to um, work with this pandemic is to mitigate and not eliminate the risk. Um, the uh, COVID-19 is a virus and the virus will, as it is spreading in the community, and our whole goal, as Dr. Fauci says, is to mitigate the risk, what we can do to help us be healthy and um, decrease a rapid spread of the virus. So the first question is ranking in order of importance the most effective practices that schools can implement in lessening the risk associated with the COVID-19. Um, and the um, choices are masks, hand washing, social distancing, and temperature monitoring specifically. I think masks are uh, the probably the most key thing because if someone's sneezing or coughing, um, the mask is there as the barrier. Um, definitely hand washing, preferably uh, before people leave home, and um, also frequently throughout the day is also number two. Uh, social distancing, especially when possible, the, the six feet is, is number three. Um, and each of these are important things. Um, the last um, temperature monitoring, although that can be helpful, it's not going to, uh, number one, there's problems with accuracy with the temperature. If the kids are overheated coming into the school, and many times the temperature reads too low. Um, so we'll talk about temperature a little bit later. The second question is how critical to controlling virus is measuring the students' temperatures when they arrive at school? Um, so the first thing I would wanna say with that question is that ideally, um, the best action would be for the parents to check the temperature at home uh, because then if they don't have a fever at home, the likelihood of not having one at school um, is really great. And also not giving Tylenol or Motrin or anything in the morning to mask any symptoms. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics has a, a statement on the temperatures and it says the temperature testing the temperature is not feasible prior to the start of school in most locations and is not known to reduce the likelihood of spread. So it speaks to the inaccuracy of the temperature taking. Um, certainly somebody, I think Dr. Fauci said one day he came into work and his temperature was 103 and he wasn't sick. Um, my experience with the temperature taking is it's always on the low side and I don't quite know how accurate that is. So the schools are trying to reach that threshold. Uh, the problem will be in how do you do that with social distancing? How do you give any privacy to that? So temperature taking is a way to eliminate kids who are sick, but it doesn't diagnose COVID-19. So question number three is what would you recommend a family do when a family member exhibits signs uh, consistent with COVID-19? 
So my first advice to the, the family would be to be aware if you've been around anyone with COVID-19 who's actually been documented and tested because I've heard people call and they'll say, well, I was around a bunch of people and one person had a cough, so I'm worried that I could have COVID-19. You could have COVID-19, but unless we really know for sure that person had it, we're going to be uh, probably overreacting to a lot of things that are not COVID-19. When the hospitals test uh, for COVID-19, uh, the numbers may be five out of 100 are positive, depending on where you are. So there's a lot of people who have symptoms who don't have COVID-19. Um, and those main symptoms are uh, the fever would be a big threshold, so a, a low-grade fever or medium-grade fever uh, over 100.2. Um, runny nose, uh, headache, backache, sore throat, chills with the fever, uh, fatigue, um, diarrhea. Um, those are the many symptoms. So if a family member has all those, and the one that's more diagnostic would be loss of taste or smell because that's so common, um, that would raise your worry uh, to a much higher level that they could have COVID-19. So they would want to talk to their healthcare provider and then uh, there are more and more testing sites opening up for COVID-19. Um, because up until now, children from the age of 3 to 18, uh, unless they're going to the hospital, cannot be easily tested. I believe in the next couple of weeks that will be much more easily done. But the, the thing I want people to remember is if you have one or two of those symptoms and you haven't had exposure to COVID-19, um, you should treat it as typically a virus and you should watch to see if that changes. Uh, and if it changes, then that would escalate you to getting tested. So question number four is, what is an advisable course of action for the district to follow should an individual student be diagnosed with COVID-19? So as far as being diagnosed, again, the, the thing we want to stress with that is that they should have a test for COVID-19, um, which is positive, and that would be a, a nose swab test by one of the health systems, or um, which would probably be where it would be through um, either um, the Cleveland Clinic or University, um, possibly Lake Hospital. Um, if you have a diagnosed positive test, then that student should be quarantined um, and teacher too would be quarantined for 10 days at home, um, isolated. So the, the school district's um, job would be getting that reported and tracking it, I think, because they would have some input into that. Um, the health department's actual job is to get the positive result and to track it. And so my hope is that the health department and the school will be able to cross-share information, uh, number one, so that the school will know how many cases that we're having, uh, and number two, so that they can make plans um, to work with the community to see how much of the virus is in our community or our surrounding community. Because if we're having hundreds and hundreds of cases, then the school might have to do something different if we're having one or two cases. So the, the immediate thing um, for the family to do is when they get a positive result to have that child or that uh, adult isolate themselves. The family needs to isolate themselves too because the, the county will, health department will get a positive result and the people who are within uh, 15 minutes um, and within six feet of that person who has it are supposed to be uh, home isolating as far as for two weeks. So the school's role is mainly just kind of being aware of what's going around and how much of that is in the community. So question five is, is it possible for that matter advisable to create a criteria for closing schools due to internal factors such as the level of COVID-19 cases within the school population? So the, my advice for that, or at least my thoughts on that are to, um, the school would be in contact with the health department. Uh, again, um, as I mentioned, to see how many cases there are, uh, how many cases in the county, how many cases in the surrounding county, <coughs> and then how many kids are missing school, 
<clears throat> and it might not just be for COVID-19, it might be for any illness. Um, and I would think the logical thing to do would be to look at how we deal with um, the flu season and uh, how we address the number of cases uh, in the flu season. Because the COVID-19, even though it's a little bit different than the flu, we're still talking about um, a respiratory infectious virus. And um, so our guidelines should be what we did during the flu season, and there should be some uh, conversation between the county health department and the school administrators and uh, spreading that information to the community so that we can make a good decision there. As far as I know, as of today, there's no set number that says this number of kids get sick, um, the school or the classroom would close, the school would close, or the county would close. Um, that would be a decision that would be made between multiple, multiple people. Question number six is how prevalent should the presence of COVID-19 in a school population be before the school closes? So um, my thinking on that would be that we need to look at the number of cases in a classroom uh, because the first question would be um, how many cases would be in a classroom before maybe that classroom would be closed? And then the second question would be how many cases um, in the global school would affect the school? Now that's a little different than the flu because the, uh, the challenge with COVID-19 is that um, you are considered exposed if you're within 15 minutes, six feet apart. So if you're within the six feet and you've been there for 15 minutes in a classroom, then by that definition, you've been exposed and you should be home. You don't necessarily need to be tested, but that classroom, if they had that um, exposure, they would all have to be home for 14 days. So the school will have to deal with the challenge if that happens, because if it happens in multiple cases, um, then it becomes just uh, uh, impractical to, to run a school. So I think if we're seeing a case here, a case there, um, the likelihood of school closure would be low, but if we're seeing cases in multiple classrooms, at some point in time there'll be a discussion with the, the teachers, the superintendent, the health department and a decision will have to be made just like um, the governor made the decision last spring about closing all schools. So question number seven is, is it advisable for West Geauga schools to create a mechanism for testing and contact tracing within the schools and the families of our students and staff? So the, the testing um, it would be done by the health system um, and any positive tests will be reported to the county that you live in. Um, so the counties will communicate that to the schools so that the schools could work with the county to determine um, what exposure there was under the guidelines of 15 minutes and six feet proximity of the person who has it. So. Uh, from what I understand is that the, the county would be working closely with the school. The school would actually kind of know where that child's been and how many people he's been exposed to given those guidelines of six feet and 15 minutes. Um, and then they would um, make recommendations to, number one, that child would definitely be home because the county would have told the family uh, that they'd be home. And their home is 10 days from the start of symptoms, not 10 days from the test. So I want to make sure people understand that the, the, uh, the guidelines for being home is 10 days from when you start your symptoms and your quarantine. The quarantine for the family members, and, and this is where it gets difficult, and the other kids in this classroom, is it's 14 days from that exposure. So if Johnny's been sick for five days, and um, he's, again, quarantined for 10 total days from the beginning, but if Billy was exposed to Johnny in the classroom, it would be 14 days from that time of exposure, uh, being home in a home quarantine environment. Um, so the school's role in testing would not be any part of it. The testing would be done by the health system, but the school would play a critical role in the following of the cases, and that would go into the impact of the schools continuing to stay open. So 
So question number eight is, what do you see as the biggest problem schools face in dealing with the pandemic? And I think the, uh, the one of the biggest problems for the school is that this is a contagious virus uh, that can affect people differently at all different ages. Um, but it's not, uh, at this point, it's not easily diagnosed. So the school is going to have the challenge where people will be worried, uh, rightly so, that they could have COVID-19. And all those questions will be raised up as far as uh, were you tested, were you exposed to somebody, or do you just have symptoms? And I think uh, the school and the community will have to develop uh, somewhat of a common sense practical approach as far as you're a parent and your child has some mild symptoms. Um, you know, deciding that they should do the right thing is always err on the side of staying home, see how long the symptoms last, talk to your healthcare provider. The big challenge for the school will be when a child comes into the school and has symptoms, they will actually have to isolate that child and the nurse will have to have um, what we call the PPE. She'll have to be uh, dressed in a gown and the child will have to be isolated in an area. And logistically, that would be not difficult if it's one or two kids, but the school is going to have a big challenge if six kids come into the nurse today and they all have fevers and they all have sore throats and they all have colds. Um, that's going to overwhelm the nurse, the school, and at some point that will lead to the question of do we keep the school open or not. So, so I think the, the big challenge for the school is to as it's being open is to help monitor with the county health department, monitoring the number of cases, the number of students who are sick, the number of teachers and adults who are sick. And then at some point, since they're monitoring this daily really, they have to be, um, they'll be able to make a quick decision when things, hopefully they don't, but if they reach a threshold where it's, uh, it's not safe for everybody that the decisions would be made. For question number nine is, what do you see as potential solutions to these problems? Um, again, I was gonna help refer to the American Academy of Pediatrics, but they mention evidence suggests that spacing three feet may approach the benefit of six feet, particularly if the students wear face mask covering. So yes, our goal is six feet, um, but there is some evidence that the three to six feet, if people are worried that kids might come a little bit closer, if they're wearing the face mask, um, that can decrease the anxiety a little bit because the practicality of always being exactly six feet is going to be a challenge for the school. Um, the school also weigh the pros and cons, like I mentioned, of the six feet uh, and if it's feasible that that can actually be done. And the goal always is to mitigate and again not eliminate, so we're trying to decrease the risk of spread. Um, the Academy of Pediatrics mentions in the pre-K group cohorting classes, um, if classes or time can be done outside, limiting visitors, um, and of course, um, helping with um, the distance, realizing the practical ability of keeping pre-K kids um, distance. They talk about elementary education being face coverings, um, especially are ideal, but there is some limitations on kids touching their face, playing with masks, and uh, things like that can, can um, not be beneficial. Um, but we still are encouraging the face masks and all kids who have the ability to wear them, uh, even with some underlying issues as far as sensory issues or um, anxiety issues um, taken into account for their safety. Um, and trying to keep at least hopefully six feet, but if we can be the three to six feet, you have a little bit of room because kids are going to be very hard to control them uh, in any environment. Uh, and also cohorting kids into classes and also if they can be outside. And then the, uh, the older kids, the physical distancing is actually the bigger impact for them, but also um, one of the things they stressed on the older kids is trying to have the students stay in one place, and um, this is from the American Academy of Pediatrics, but the teachers move versus the students moving. If uh, classes have to change between teacher and student, uh, their guidance was keeping students in one classroom and having teachers move to different ones. So that's one other thing to think about. And all of these things, whether they're in any age group, 
Uh, they all are ideals that we're trying to reach and trying to be realistic that uh, the goal is to, to try to reach them but realize that there's potential challenges on any given day and um, there will never with hundreds and hundreds of kids be a uh, perfect day so everyone's going to have to learn to work together with this. So question number 10 is um, suggested social distancing protocols pose serious challenges for transporting students on school buses. What measures would you see as the most important for the schools to implement to lessen the risk of infection on rides to and from school? So I did some research into what the American Academy of Pediatrics guidance is and, um, and I believe the school is going to be doing that, but assigning seats is a great way to start uh, any transportation policy because then we know who's in what seat uh, and there's not a debate of um, who's going to be where. And the goal, since we're talking about six feet distancing, would be to have one student per seat. Uh, again, the American Academy of Pediatrics mentions three to six feet if they had to be, as long as they're wearing a mask. So I think the district is really trying to achieve the one student, one seat. Um, but I think parents should also feel some degree of comfort that uh, if they are three feet apart with a, a space in between where nobody can sit, um, that would be acceptable on um, small situations where the majority are doing one child per one seat. Um, they also mentioned cohorting, so the same kids are on the buses, of course wearing face masking, um, and uh, encouraging students to use alternative methods of transportation if possible uh, would also help to um, alleviate some uh, congestion on the buses uh, would be another idea. So question number 11 is, is there a practical, broadly agreed upon standard by which West Yaga School Board and administration can assess what degree of risk our students and staff and their families is acceptable? Um, so my feeling for this last question and to kind of summarize is I think that number one, we need to look at the viral load in our community. Um, so when we're talking about any kind of um, plan or policy, we need to know basically all the information that we can have on our hands. And so number one would be information, how much of the virus is in the community. Uh, and this would be real-time information because it, it won't help to know this a week later. But on a daily basis to have the people in charge, administrators, this, the um, Jaga County Health Department communicating how many people have this, is this number increasing? Is this number going up and down? Um, and then um, the second recommendation is, I think, having a contact person for the school. And I believe the school has one person who is the COVID contact person because there's going to be a lot of information sharing, planning. And uh, I would think the advice of all school districts would be have one contact person. Certainly there's a lot of voices, but uh, there's going to be a lot of information that needs to be processed. Um, number three, um, since we are a community and uh, parents are a key part of the community with the children, is the uh, parents, um, I would encourage all to do their part as far as uh, a common sense approach as we always do every year. If your child's sick, err on the side of keeping them home. If you're worried that they have could have the COVID or you know for sure you've been exposed, then talk to your healthcare provider as far as whether you should or shouldn't get tested or quarantined. And I think the school can um, work with the community uh, to help with the education uh, because I think we're all going through this and I think um, the key, key thing is f flexibility and just remembering that we're trying to mitigate this, we're trying to lessen the spread and if our goal is 100% elimination, um, that would be very difficult to do. So what we all want to do, the health department, the school, the teachers, the families, is to lessen the spread and try to do what's right for all of us and to keep us all healthy and to still receive an education. 
So I want to thank uh, you for this chance to talk with you all. I thank Mr. Kish for helping to arrange this. Uh, and I, I hope this has been uh, informative in helping people understand um, a little bit more about what this virus is and how this virus can affect people in school and in the community and uh, touching all our lives as it is. So um, I wish you all well and to stay healthy.